Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. My name is Dr. Paul. I'm here with Dr. Stavros. Hey. Today, we're going to give you our top five tips for absolutely crushing your clinical years in medical school. So if you are interested in learning what it takes to be a top student, a standout student, and to position yourself for amazing letters of recommendation, stick around. This video is for you. Before we dive in, do us a huge favor, hit that like button below, subscribe, set up notifications, and we will send you alerts every time we release a brand new video. All right, Dr. Stavros, we've got some really good information to share today with our viewers. Let me go through the top five tips, and then we'll break down each one. I will each put our two cents in so they can get a lot of value out of this. So sure. tip number one is to dedicate yourself to taking on a leadership role. Tip number two is to create your daily study schedule that's kind of obvious in theory, but we'll talk to you about how to set up a study schedule to work around your work hours to help you really get ahead with your studies. Tip number three is to network a ton. Networking is super valuable and we'll explain why and how to do it. Tip number four is be the first to arrive and be the last to leave. This is probably our secret weapon for our students who have been getting outstanding letters of recommendation and we'll tell you exactly what we mean by this. And tip number five is to do a deep dive every single day into commonly seen problems that you see in the wards so that every day you're more informed than the average student so you can ask much better questions that ultimately will help you stand out during your clinical. So, Dr. Stavros, tip number one is dedicating yourself to taking on a leadership role. Can you explain to the students why taking a leadership role is so important and so valuable to becoming a standout during your clinical years? Well, think of it this way. If I'm the attending physician, you're my student, and you come up to me and you say, you know, Dr. Stavros, I want to really take, you know, I want to be able to help you out and then connect with you and the other students and take that leadership role because big programs like internal medicine, clinical rotations, they need those kind of leaders. Next thing you know, when you're with that individual every day and you're with your physician on a daily basis, when the time comes to getting an LOR, well, will the physician, me, write a letter for you knowing that I've talked to you each and every day, you've communicated with me, I've seen you at your best, or somebody who maybe I've only seen one hour a day. So not only does that transition over to getting a, good, a really good LOR, but then at the same time, you build that, that work ethic, that discipline of taking on the leadership, discussing with other students, taking that leader role that's going to go into other rotations and then go on to, a, to being a resident and attending physician. So if you want those LORs and you want to really show the physician who you are and how dedicated you are to whatever specialty, why not try to do the best you possibly can to be a leader amongst your peers so then you get everything and move on forward from there? Yeah. You should think of these leadership roles as setting yourself up for a letter recommendation that will demonstrate the things that most programs want to see. Programs love to see when a student is a leader. They don't want to see people who just stand at the back of the crowd, don't have anything to say. They want someone who is going to step up when it counts, someone who's going to lead the pack, because guess what? They want residents who can come in on day one, take the lead right away, get to work, and not be a burden on everyone else. So if you take on these roles, not only will you develop the skills needed to lead a team, the people who write your LORs are going to point this out because like you said, you're always working next to them. You're working one-on-one -on -one with them. They see you in this role and when they write your LORs, this is a thing that they're going to point out. Excellent leadership skills. Yeah. That is one of the most important things a physician going into residency can have because like I said, programs want people who are just going to come in, take the bull by the horns, dive in and get their stuff done. They don't want people who are just so needy are always going to be asking questions. And to be honest with you, you know, a LOR, a bad LOR is not going to say, oh, he's really needy. It's just not going to stand out because it's not right. going to say he's a great leader. So you have to keep that in mind. Always take a leadership role because it is going to get you great LORs. That's going to get you more interviews and probably higher quality interviews too, because you know, you can't be a leader. I mean, you can't not be a leader and get into a Harvard or Princeton or a Yale. The best programs want strong leaders, See, bottom line. But it's a little disclaimer because for those out there listening and watching, there's many that want to be 
a leader and others just want a really good LOR to get in a good program, <clears throat> being a leader is going to have be a lot of dedication and sacrifice. Because when I was a leader in internal medicine, I got there three hours earlier. I printed, because we had to, print out all the, the patients for the day. Me and the co-leader, we had to split up the group accordingly. And patients had, you know, certain students in our group. One student had to go to ICU, two students had to go to the ER, one had to shadow a nurse, and I had to stay later every day because we had to communicate with our uh, preceptors and our attendings. We had to go there on the weekends. So yeah, you put the time in. You don't just have a leadership role title without really putting that leadership role um, skill and, and time. So those who want it, make sure you're ready for it because they will give you a lot of responsibility for good reason to get the results too, right? To be a better position in the future. And that extra responsibility is going to put you outside of your comfort zone, that's when you actually grow, get better. And that's what you want. The more times uh, you take on a leadership role, the more responsibility you have, the more discomfort you feel, the better you have to be. That's ultimately want, what you want. And if you're paying a fortune to go through med school, wouldn't you want to get as much out of it as you can? So this is also going to just get you more bang for your buck. <clears throat> love it. Love it. Love it. All right. Tip number two is create your daily study schedule. Now we have this one on here because a lot of students tend to think that they can go to work nine to five and then just go home and, and hang out. When in fact, the best students are going through the rotation, but also studying that rotation's information on an ongoing basis. So just let's use internal as an example, 12 week, 12 week rotation. Every single day, you should be putting in two to three hours of study. So you, know, you wanna go over the things you learned that day so that you can actually dive deeper. We'll talk about that shortly. But you should always be going through a, either a board review series book, a, a video course, um, online med ed, Kaplan, whatever you want. I use Kaplan. That was a long time ago. You should be learning the ins and outs of the specialty while you're going through it. Now, a lot of students find it very difficult to just go home, hang out for a couple hours, and then study at night because they're tired. They work all day. Our recommendation is this. Either go in to work a couple hours early and use that as study time. You're also going to be at work where you might see more cases, more emergencies, or stay after work. If you can't get up early, stay after work. So if they say four o'clock, you can leave, go sit down in the lounge, pull out your computer, your books, study for a couple hours, treat that as just part of your day. So make it a habit that I don't go home until I've done my at least two hours or whatever you're going to you know, commit to that day. If you do this, you'll chip away slowly at it, but you have more time to really master in detail instead of waiting till let's say third year is over and you're like, Oh, let me get ready for CK now. And then you're like, I only have three weeks, but I also have a busy schedule. What are you going to do? You're going to rely on, you're going to say, you're going to be one of these people who submits a question on Reddit saying, I have three weeks. What's better uh, first aid or step up. And you haven't done any of the detail work. Yeah. That's going to put you in a position where you're going to probably suffer on your CK. If you actually take the time, Every day, just a little bit of time to go through it. You can go into a lot more detail. That's going to build your foundation better. And that's ultimately going to make your life a lot easier when it comes time for dedicated CK prep because you've already done the work. Now it's just a review. And to go into a lot of detail about how to prepare properly for CK during your clinicals, in the link below, we have a link to our free webinar where we talk about the 10 most common challenges med students are facing. It's free. Click the link below and you can go, we'll walk you through the step-by-step -step how to master your step one prep, your CK prep, everything. So I just wanted to throw that in there because we're not going to go into too much detail here, but you can get that detail in that free webinar. I mean, to paint a picture, uh, you know, a lot of our friends and colleagues in residency and, and, and being an attending, they're on social media. They have their yep. blogs, they have this, they have that. And yes, you might think they have a certain team, of course, but... Think of it this way, they, they, their attendings or their residents, they're working nonstop. They might have a family and wife and a husband, spouse, kids, and they're studying and they're doing everything else. There's no magic hour, meaning there's no extra hours in the day. They have 24 hours like you, like I, like our viewers right now. The difference is they've been working from medical school, scheduling, being disciplined, knowing, okay, I don't like to study in the evenings. I get out of work eight o'clock at night. I'm not gonna study. I'll just wake up two hours earlier get my two hours in. So then by the end of the week, I've done all those hours of studying. See, if you start from now, hopefully now watching our video from, from the beginning, then you get to a point where when you are in residency, you might have a wife, a husband, kids, you might be vlogging, you might be making videos like these, and also studying for step three. So you see, life continues, guys. I hope you know that there will never be a perfect time. You won't have the most time except when you're finished second year medical school. 
and they give you three, four months for step one, that's, that's gold. After that, good luck. If you're not balancing yourself, it's going to be very challenging. I laugh for a reason to, to conquer your rotations, electives, NCK, NCS, and everything else. So practice from now, guys. Practice from now. Awesome tips. All right, tip number three, network a ton. Ooh. Ooh. So there's two types of networking we can do, in person and then online. If you are in rotation, so we're talking specifically about crushing your clinical years. Yeah. If you're in rotations, everybody you meet should be someone that you are networking with. Now, this is something that I didn't really think about even when I was on the island. Everybody in my school could have been a networking contact. I didn't think that way. So I'm going to give you guys tips from today forward. Anybody in a rotation you're with, anybody you're in school with, anybody you come across in the professional setting, I don't care if you can't stand them, you don't like them, you don't want to be friends with them. Think of them as a professional network, um, someone in your professional network, meaning build a relationship with them. And it doesn't, you don't have to hang out and get beers and, and go to dinner on Friday. But be professional with them to the point where you respect them, they respect you. And what that's going to do, it's going to open you up to just a world of possibilities. You know, there's always people who always seem to know someone like, you know, hey, I need a uh, hip replacement surgery. I, I got the perfect guy for you. My, uh, my grandfather had a heart attack and he's, you know, he's in Manhattan and uh, he's struggling. You know what? I know someone in, uh, in the city. Uh, let me get you in touch with them. Um, you know. I want to invest in real estate, but I don't know what I'm doing. You know what? I have a great real estate lawyer I can put you in touch with. Some people seem to have someone for every occasion. That's because they're looking at every interaction as a networking opportunity. So what you guys should do is, like I said, you don't have to be best friends with people, but be professional with everyone and build that mutual respect to the point where you can exchange information so that, hey, if, if I got a question or you got a question, text me, call me. If you do this consistently throughout your entire medical school career, you're going to have so many people in your network that any problem that arises, if you know someone on the West Coast, the East Coast, down in the South, you're going to have someone you can reach out to. And this is especially powerful if you are applying to residency and you know residents, you know attendings, you can reach out to them and say, hey, I just applied to the program. You know, you mentioned to me a few months back that you could put in a good word for me, um, you know, calling in the favor, hopefully you can help. This is super powerful because a lot of students don't think like this. And what they do is they just depend on their USMLEs and other things to get them interviews. Why not leverage your network? You can also do this on social media. We teach our students in our residency roadmap program how to use Instagram and Twitter to build networks. Just doing this, except when you're online, you can be way, way, way more broad. So I might be in Chicago, but I'm building a networks, uh, my network and my network connections in California, in Arizona, in Florida, in New York, in Maine, everywhere. So networking is, should be part of your day-to-day. -day. Every day you should try to make one new networking contact. And if you put in a little bit of effort, think about it. Over the course of four years, you're going to have over 1,200 people you can reach out to. One is the minimum. You should always go for more. But if you can do one a day, man, does that add up to some really powerful, leverageable um, opportunities. So it's very important. Do not overlook it. What I don't understand, I mean, I get it. People are scared. People are, because you're not, you're not sure of something. You're not, a, you're not, you don't know how to use it. So some people are scared because of that mm -hmm. or in fear of using it. But think of it this way. We had to wait, meaning you still have to do it for your clinical rotation, but you had to go to physical hospitals to connect with people, shake hands, eventually get to know somebody. You can literally be on your couch watching Netflix and on, on mute hanging out on your laptop and connecting with somebody, not just swiping and liking a picture and saying, oh, nice, nice, you know, picture at the beach or a margarita or whatever, or love, love the lobster you have to lunch. It's more like I would spend half hour a day connecting with as many people as possible because the connection is not going to be a relationship right away, right? It's going to take time. It's going to, it's going to have, have, it has to grow. So if you see it this way, there's no excuse that if you're a first year or second year medical school watching, a medical student watching this, that by the time you get to residency, you know, applying for residency, you don't have a couple hundred solid, mm -hmm. strong relationships. Because if you don't have it by then, that means you didn't do, you didn't add, you didn't work on it day to day. It doesn't happen overnight, guys. You have to keep building that, you have that to build it, yeah. foundation. It takes time, but how bad do you want it? Your competitors, they don't want it, they don't want it that bad. So they won't have the connections you do. So hope that uh, helps. I, I, you know, I, I meet with every single one of our um, 
yeah. residency roadmap students at the very beginning to explain to them why they need to network and I explain to them how to do it. And I always say to them this, let's say, um, and most of them are, you know, first, second, third, fourth year, they're somewhere along the journey. So it ultimately it doesn't matter. But I say to them, imagine your dream is to be in New York. Okay. And right now, let's say you're doing your rotations in um, Knoxville, Tennessee, who cares where it is. And so I say, if you start networking right now and you make four to five connections every day with every attending, every resident, every nurse in the hospital system in New York city, and you genuinely do the things I tell you and you build these, these relationships. If you do that now for the next year, by the time you go to apply to your internal medicine residency, you will ideally have a relationship with, you know, a good chunk of that population who's on social media. How much leverage do you think you're going to have in compared to someone else who let's say you apply and they apply, you guys got equal scores, equal everything, but you can reach out to all of these network relationships you built and say, Hey, just applied to your program. I'm wondering if you could put in a good word for me. Now, obviously you have to get to a point where you're comfortable enough to do that. And that's doable. We teach them how to do that. But imagine you could reach out to everybody and say, Hey, I applied to your program and you're on a, a good enough basis with them where they say, you know what, let me talk to the PD and see if I can get in and uh, get you an interview. Now, I'm not saying that's always going to happen, but it's a numbers game. If you set it to 100 people and even just 10% said, sure, that could be 10 interviews that you otherwise might not have gotten. So the power of your network is, you, I can't even explain how powerful it is. And, and let me just end this part on this. There's a very popular saying in the business world where your network is equal to your net worth. Right. The, better your network, the more earnings you will have. So if you have a very rich network, rich just meaning vast and in, in widespread, you're going to just advance through the system faster and you're going to get better opportunities because it's a lot of it is who you know. So in business, we always say, you know, if, if the only people I hang around with are people who just hang out and play video games and do nothing all day, and I'm trying to build a big business, they're not going to, I'm not going to advance because they're not going to teach me anything. But if I have a Jeff Bezos and an Elon Musk and a Mark Zuckerberg in my network, that would be a dream. But if I had people who were ahead of me where I want to be, then I'm going to be able to learn from them, level up, and they're going to be able to offer me opportunities that's going to allow me to advance. So you have to realize how powerful a network is. And if this talk hasn't convinced you, then there's no convincing you. And take what you just said and put it into not only studying for step one, CK, because if it's a virtual setting, which is is right now in 2020, because a lot of classes are suspended, everything's online, yep, yep. you have to connect with people, right? So then you're going to meet, like we talk about all the time, study partners, you're going to meet somebody, want somebody who's going to be dedicated, maybe a little smarter than you, more dedicated yeah. than you, you, same concept, guys. So you might think, ah, oh, it doesn't pertain to me. Everything pertains mm -hmm. to you. It's networking, especially now because virtual, we're connecting with you right now. Very simple. I mean, when my sister started residency, it started July of 2020. Orientation was in June. So just the other day, she goes to me, two of my residents have been asking about you. About me? <laughs> yeah, because they watch you on Instagram, you and Dr. Paul are on Facebook. I'm like, that's cool. And they're like, they kind of feel like they know you. I'm like, well, I met them once. They go, no, but they really feel like they know you for years because every day there's like some motivation, inspirational, funny stuff. Yeah. See, so I haven't really even got to know them, but they have a connection with me because they see us through our social media. There's a network. I can call them up and say, hey, listen, let's get together when I'm up there. They'll say, of course, let's come, on, come, on, come hang out in the hospital. So it's good very, stuff. Very powerful, very underappreciated yeah. by med students and really everybody. So anyway, let's move on because I mean, we could talk about networking and the power of networking forever. <laughs> tip four, tip four, which we do a lot, yeah. Tip right four. Way. Tip four is to be the first to arrive and be the last to leave. I'm going to let you take this one. Why is it so important that you're there before everyone and that you're there after everyone? If well? you're not there and the people, you don't, first of all, you don't want to know who is, who's watching you. And you might think, oh, well, I didn't get the pat on the back. You bet, <laughs> you'll be surprised. Mm -hmm. After a couple of weeks of working in the hospital, you're going to get approached and be like, hey, you know, Mike Smith, whatever, John. You know, I've seen you a lot. You've here always in the morning, always in the evening. Even if you don't see somebody, you don't get, you know, acknowledged, recognized, uh, they will see you when you're there in the morning. They will see you there when you're, when they are about to leave and you're still there. And that's the impression. Not only are you making to them, but also to yourself, because then when they sit down, they go, wow, this guy's always around. This girl's always here every day. 
I mean, you're dedicated, right? So why wouldn't you not only be there to learn, be there to show everybody, hey, I'm really, I really do care about medicine. Now, granted, if you don't have it in you, if you're not motivated, you're not inspired, you're going to leave. Guaranteed, you're going to go home. You're gonna go of course, home of course. But then don't call us and say, hey, listen, I want to get into dermatology and surgery. Because at that point, like, well, what did you do? Nothing. Okay. So it was easy for Dr. Paul and I when we had electives. Many electives that I had were like two hours a day. I stayed all day because I'm like, okay, I got to find out who is really important in the hospital, which doctor really has a lot of pull, meaning also to get residency at the same time, interviews and maybe experience in the ICU and PEDS and ER. And then I got to a point where I went to every M&M, mortality morbidity conference, every tumor board, every grand rounds, every morning report, woke up at 4 a.m., got there by five, started at six o'clock. I was the first one. I'm like, all right, if they keep seeing me, they're going to come talk to me now. Eventually, they came talk to me because they figured you're a medical student. These are the attendings. And there's only one medical student at six o'clock in the morning. That was me. So I, even, I didn't even have to say hello. They came to me and they asked me, hey, you're always here every morning. So if you put the time into it, dedicate, and you'll get amazing LORs, amazing experience, which then will transition over into CK, CS, again, over the same thing, right? Just do it now. You will see the results later. Don't expect the results right away, guys, because you won't see it right away. I can guarantee that. So two quick things. Number one, quick story. Uh, when me and Dr. Stavros were in our rotations together, I noticed him very early, and then I started coming early, and then he started coming earlier. And then before you know it, we were just both living at the hospital. Like, literally, <laughs> we just uh, we rented out a room. Anyway, um, that's obviously not true, but that's kind of like the mentality you want to take is just don't let anyone outwork you. No. Right. If someone's coming in early, at least show up with them. Maybe you make a really good friend, a good study partner. Uh, the other thing I want to ask you, and I know I have a lot of examples, how much more hands on experience, uh, like assisting with surgeries, just doing procedures like inserting central lines. How many additional things did you or can you maybe ballpark that you got outside of your typical, you know, uh, nine to five just by being er there earlier and staying later? Like ballpark it for me. I would say at least 50 to 70% more than every, any average medical student or any student that I yeah, had. Yeah, that's I, what I would say. Because, I mean, there was times where people would leave at 5 p.m. I'm like, you know what? I'll stay. Then when it was slow, I'd go to the ER. That's how I met Dr. Sharif, the guy that was, was still friends to this day. He goes, hey, come on in. I met him a couple of times. Then it got to a point where he showed me how to do this in the ER. I was doing internal medicine, and I was stitching people because he goes, hey, you've been here every day. I actually took a picture of his schedule with his permission. I'm like, do you mind if I come down when you're available? He goes, yeah, if I'm here, come on in. It took a couple of days to connect with him. You know, you got to get to sure. know me. Then he goes, all right, follow me. I'll show you what I know. Prove to me what you, what you can do. And it got to a point where I was, I was in the ER with eight beds, eight, eight nurses, and he was kind of like just watching me move from room to room, I mean, from bed to bed, because I wanted it, though. There's a difference, right? I wanted to learn. I, didn't, I wasn't fake. I was like, I, just teach me. So yeah, 50, I, at least 50% more than any other student that I was, was running, besides you, any other student was running side by side with me because we were going neck to neck. So, so we're head to head. Yeah. I, uh, my very first rotation was internal medicine and I latched on to a resident. Do you remember Dr. Joseph? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Joseph. Oh, yeah. So I, I sort of, uh, you know, latched on to him. He was a, a very friendly guy. And then once I finished internal, I would just do the same thing. I would just show up on the internal wards and I would hang out with him and he would let way, way beyond me finishing internal. I was helping him. He would say, just go put in a line here, do this, do that. I was doing all kinds of stuff for him and learning and, you know, just involved in countless codes. Um, you know, sometimes there's not an OB available and, you know, a med student has to run up with a resident and, uh, deliver a baby like just a lot of stuff happens after hour. you know when the sun goes down the crazy stuff starts happening but that's when you really learn and get better and gain opportunities especially you know if you're doing interviews let's say and um, a PD or, or an attending at a residency interview says tell me about the most interesting thing that happened to you in fourth year you're gonna probably have a lot of really good stories that other people won't have just because you stuck around because like I said usually the crazy stuff happens at night during the day, everyone's just, you know, your CHF patients, your diabetic patients, you're just rounding, nothing crazy. It always happens at night. So be first to arrive, last to leave. It also will just teach you discipline, which you're going to need to develop to be a good doctor. You know, I was listening to this podcast the other day because, you know, I, you and I always go back and forth with podcasts. 
there was there was a thing that was brought up. If you have difficult, because I now brought up for a reason. If I know students are watching, say, you know what? It's easy for you guys to say it because you've done it. Okay, so I'll, there's, a, there's a little test. If you have difficulty staying motivated, difficulty being inspired, then use social media, meaning post something, say something for accountability. Tell somebody, listen, I want to be the best doctor. I want to be an anesthesiologist. I want to be internal medicine. Or tell your attending or tell your students, I'm going to be there every day. Because as soon as you announce it, then you're held accountable for it. Yep. See? So if you're not account- held accountable, you don't have to show up. You can, you can skip. But if you say, you know what, I'm going to prove to myself I want to be the best physician or learn as much as possible, announce it. So then you're held accountable because it's embarrassing if you don't follow through, right? So hope that helps. That's Very much so. To us, but you, know, you have to actually implement it yourself end of the day. Yeah. Awesome yeah. tips. Awesome tips. All right. Our fifth and final tip is to deep dive into commonly seen problems so that you can ask strong questions during rounds. And this is really a way to not only improve your knowledge, which will help you just be better on the wars, be better on CK. But one of the most impressive things that you can do while you're rounding every single day is ask questions that actually show that you're doing the homework, that you're studying at home and you're interested. So instead of just asking something silly like, well, what's the first line medication for uh, you know, a CHF exacerbation? Well, I mean, I can Google that and find out in five seconds. Ask me something about the detailed physiology or the why is this EKG change when a patient's leaning on their side, but when they stand up, something detailed that shows that you are interested and that you're very thoughtful. And so what I recommend students do is every single day, have a list of the things that you saw that day. Like I said earlier, write down, I saw a CHF patient, a diabetic patient. I had a patient with this, a patient with that. Go home, go to you buy yourself a subscription to up to date the best fifty dollars you would probably ever spend. It's monthly, but it's invaluable. Investment, investment, it's an investment. It's an investment. And go and read in detail. Learn, take notes on every single one of these topics. And then when you do this, you'll notice you have questions that come up. Write down your questions. And then and during the day, when the attending says, Does anybody have questions? Yes, I have some questions. Can I ask them? You ask. And it's probably going to be super impressive when your questions are things that no one's ever asked. And if you can do that on a regular basis, that's just one of those other things you can do to stand out. So imagine an attending right to an LOR says, amazing uh, leadership skills, was the first to arrive, the, the last to leave every day, highly committed, very inquisitive, asked insanely good questions. They're not going to use those, that language, but you get the point. It's just something else that they can add to your LOR that just makes you super unique as compared to the rest of the people. We always tell people, if you want to be an average? So if you want to get an average USMLE score, just follow the masses. What is everyone else doing? That's the easiest way to be average. If you want to be above average and, and well above average, ask the outliers what they're doing. Tips like this that, you know, no one's going to tell you this. I've never heard anyone say, yeah, you know, everyone says do this. No one tells you to do these things because they're hard but the hard things are what help you become an outlier. And those things that help you become an outlier get you outstanding LORs that gets you more interviews at better places that gets you to that residency. So doc, anything you want to jump in and say here? It's, this kind of goes, goes hand in hand with everything you do in life. Because for example, I have been talking to you for a long time about eating healthy and working out. And I admit mm-hmm. my, I admit to myself, like it, it took time for me to get motivated to work out because I'm like, I'd rather work, on us, on any other students. And, but then you said, well, if you, don't want, if you don't just get up and do it, you'll never do it. If you don't take care of yourself, right? It's an investment in your own self, mental, physical state. So then you're healthier for us, with students. For Same thing. You guys can reach out to us all day long and say, what do I have to do to get a high score, to get into dermatology or surgery or radiology or whatever? How do I become a leader? How do I get an amazing LOR? We can tell you guys till we turn blue, but it's how bad you want it. If you don't want it, it's perfectly fine. But then you have to settle, which is something I never want to say, or I hope I pass, instead of saying, you know what, I've chosen a path. It's not easy. We're telling you, it's not like a, you don't swallow a magic pill. <laughs> Literally, you have to go <laughs> each and every day. If only. You to work. You're not going to get a pat on the back. And I'm telling you, they're not going to pat. No one's going to pat you on the back. No. Pat yourself on the back and say, okay, I've sacrificed. And the reason why I tell you this, specific example, was an ortho uh, physician that my friend was working with. And he was so tough. So my, my friend was like, you know what? I'm working every day. I'm, I'm, I'm really going nuts on this. And I'm not even getting a thank you. At the end of the rotation, ortho guy goes up to him and goes, you know what? You're one of the only students in the past three years that has shown me dedication, sacrifice. You took everything I gave you. 
And because of that, my friend, not only did he give him a, a LOR, the guy was a cyclist and he had a collection of, of, of bicycles, like cycling you know, bikes. He gave him a bike. He goes, you know what? I'm going to give you one because, you know, really? we, talk, we talk throughout the whole rotation. Point is, he never had any, he never got a thank you. But the last day he was blown away by this, by this ortho physician, by the ortho attendant. So that just gives you an idea. If you're waiting to get, you know, hey man, thank you on day one or the second day, third day, you're not going to get it. You know, no just way. keep working, work, because this is, people will see, people see everything. But if you don't want it, then don't, then it's, you know, it's okay though. Just step back. Someone else will take your spot. No big deal. I like what you said though. Pat yourself on the back. If you did everything today that you needed to do, if you showed up early, stayed late, you know, you did the, you went the extra mile, pat yourself on the back, say, good, I did it today. And then just do it every single day. And then eventually, yeah, every day is, that's the key. You know, it's like, it's like, if I say to you, I have uh, 5 million steps and I want you to get to the top, get to the top, I'll give you a million dollars. And you're like, yeah, it sounds like too much work. Most people are going to say, I will walk those steps, but you're not going to get there in one day. You have to just do what you can in a day to get yourself that much closer. And if you do that, you'll eventually get to the goal. You'll eventually get the reward and the prize. But like you said, don't expect people to thank you or pat you on the back. You're supposed to do these things, but it's going above and beyond that will get you recognized. So there's 20 people in your IM rotation and 18 of them are just showing up, doing their work, doing a great job, but they're just showing up, doing the work. They're not really participating in anything above and beyond. They're not going to get anything special. They might get an A, but they're not going to get a great LOR. Those two people who did exactly what we just talked to you about today, are going to get great LORs, are going to get recommendations, are going to get additional things, but you have to put in the time because it's, yeah, anyone can do it for a day, a week, a month. Can you do it every single day for 12 weeks or for 24 weeks? That's the difference. There's a difference. So let's wrap it up there. Uh, Hopefully that was helpful to you guys. If you found something to be really valuable from this, do us a huge favor, leave it in the comment section below. We'd love to know what the biggest takeaway from this video was for you. While you are uh, helping us out that way, do us another favor, hit the like button, subscribe, set up notifications, and we will be sure to send you every single video that we produce. All right, thank you all for stopping by. Hopefully that was helpful. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye guys. Hey there, thanks for watching. We appreciate you spending some time with us today. We've got a couple more great videos. We got one up here, we got one up there. See you guys on the next video.